it's Jess here and welcome back to another day of Planmas. Today you're seeing my face, which I apologize, no, it's fine. <laughs> you see it through my vlogs and stuff, but we are doing again this year what I read this year. I know I lost you, it was like over an hour long. It's on the Planmas 2022 playlist if you want to check it out. But um, I was like, you know what, I probably shouldn't do one year worth of books in one video but um, I just never found the time or the mood to film it like monthly or anything so I might see about doing it next year as I work through some books but you're just gonna have to put up with my video today um, don't forget to get a drink or a snack or enjoy having this on a sort of a podcast you don't have to watch me this whole time feel free to do other things we're just chilling out in my bedroom with my Christmas bedding <laughs> And um, Heidi's down here as well. She might join us. I don't know. Um, and we're just going to chat about the books I read this year. Um, I did set myself a Goodreads challenge of 30 books. And I've re read 33. But it helps that I read like 7 graphic novels and a bunch of novellas. But you do what you can do to get up to that number. Because I don't know how some people do it, but... I can't do a lot of books, like that many books in a year, especially because a lot of the books I read are really long. Apologies if this moves a bit, but Heidi is down here playing with stuff. <laughs> you can never trust this girl, but um, I just have my coffee. It's first thing in the morning, so, and she's biting my foot because I don't want her to play with the cable. <laughs> Apologies if this wiggles a bit, but she's, um, she's in a mood this morning. So. Here we go. I'll just grab her. It's easier. There's my girl. Wow, she looks very majestic. Um, all right. She's got a winter coat on, if you can't tell. So, yeah, we're just going to go through it. I'm going to talk them in, like, uh, if they're a series, I'm going to talk about them in a group. I don't want to do any spoilers here. This is just sort of a general, like, like a general intro to books, uh, what I thought about them. I'll be honest, I didn't read any, like, bad books this year. Um, I'm pretty selective when it comes to books, and I really liked all of them. Um, so, yeah, and a lot of them I read through audiobook, so I will just scoot this over a little bit um, so we can fit some um, pictures of covers here because I do audiobook a lot, though I do have some, like, uh, physical books as well. And, um, yeah, so... But yeah, I'm not going to swallow, but I'm going to see, like, if you want to read it, you can. Um, that's the kind of information I want to give you, like, any warnings or any information. So let's get into it. Um, I think the first thing, I've got everything written down here. The first thing I want to talk about is the Brandon Sanderson Secret Projects Kickstarter. Um, during the pandemic, the fantasy writer Brandon Sanderson wrote four books in secret. <laughs> He was very productive during the pandemic, unlike some of us. I know I wasn't that that much. <laughs> so he wrote Tress of the Emerald Sea, The Frugal Wizard's Handbook for Surviving Medieval England, Yumi and the Nightmare Painter, and The Sunlit Man. And I he released them over the year, like um, every quarter. And we backed the Kickstarter last year for the audiobook and the ebook. Um, so we didn't get any of the extras, but I did uh go through that and i'm glad it, you could get the audiobook and the ebook together because i will say the yumi and the nightmare painter and the sunlit man have illustrations throughout like they're really beautiful um drawings by real artists throughout like that's a great thing i also love about brandon sanderson is that he really supports artists which i love um but yeah so i feel like you kind of you do need both if you're doing audiobook you kind of want the physical or the ebook to look at Yumi and the Nightmare Painter, especially. But we'll go into them a little bit each. So first we have Tress of the Emerald Sea. So I read this back in January, so forgive me. Um, but it's about Tress and it's, I think this book would be really good if you've never read any of his stuff and you just want a one-off book because it isn't his like cosmic universe. Not all his books are, but this one is. The Cosmere is like a bunch of planets that all are the same. You know, they're all together in the same universe. And he just like the different books of the different planets. 
So this is a completely different planet to his main series, um, Mistborn and Stormline. Uh, but it's a good one-off. You could just read it. It's really cute. This The idea of this book came around when he, him and his wife were watching The Princess Bride. And she was like, well, why? And when, what's his name? Wesley gets taken or disappears. Like, why does the princess not go after him? Why does she wait? <laughs> you know? So this book is basically Tress's prince is taken away and she goes after him. But more on the, on the actual level is that Tress, I think she's a window washer or she's a house, like she cleans the outside of houses or windows. I think that's her job. And she's really good friends and kind of falls in love with the Lord's son of their island. It's a very dreary island on the Emerald Sea. Um, there's a whole bunch of different color seas in this planet and they're all like, the sea is actually made of like gemstone crystals. It's really cool. It's a really cool uh, concept. And, um, and basically the Lord doesn't like that because she's a commoner. So he takes him away and then over a course of different stuff happening, the Lord's son gets kidnapped by a sorceress who um, lives on a very remote, like dangerous black sea. I think it is black gemstone sea. Anyway, so she, he's kidnapped and Tress is like, well, no one else is going to do anything about it. I guess I have to go. And then you kind of get like a pirating sailing adventure book <laughs> of Tress going to go on this adventure to find her, um, her, her love. So love it so much. Such a beautiful book, a really good place to start, um, in the Cosmere. Uh, and it does feature one character who's like in all of the Cosmere books. Um, he, he's like, his concept is that he's a world hopper. So he is actually able to travel from world to world. So he ends up being in a lot of different stories and worlds. His name is Hoyd, um, although he has different names and different planets. But yeah, so he features in it. So you get a little touch of the bigger Cosmere through him. Um, then I'll talk about the, the handbook for the wizards, um, the wizards handbook later after this. But I would say the, ne the next really one was Yumi and the Nightmare Painter. And this also is Hoyd in it. So you can see the connection. I also recommend You Mean the Nightmare Painter as well, because the only other story this planet has had before was um, a short story. So it's it's also another separate planet from the Cosmere, but still connected and it has Hoyt in it. And I love, this is my favorite of the group, I think. I love it. Even if you don't, you're not interested in reading it, you should go pick, you should go look at it in physical if you see it at a bookstore, because the illustrations inside are so beautiful oh my gosh I love them so much and there's so many and so I'm so glad because they're gorgeous but um, this is about two separate artists who live in two separate worlds there's Yumi who is a she's like a Yumi who's a, uh, a she is a priestess and she performs rituals in her like set of villages um, she does her art to be able to create, to bring forth spirits and then the spirits can grant wishes to villages and that's why she travels around. But her life is extremely controlled. She ha basically has no um, freedom because she has to be this priestess because she's the only one who can do this kind of task. Because um, you're kind of born with the ability and her art is stacking rocks. It's really cute. <laughs> Such an interesting art form. And there's a lot of like talk about what is art um, because of the stacking rocks. Um, and it's really, really good. It's basically a big condemnation of AI generated images, which thank you. <laughs> art is human expression. So um, there's a whole lot of stuff in that book, which I love. Um, and then you have Painter. Uh, he has a real name. I can't remember it, but he goes by Painter. And he lives in this other world, which that one's very traditional, um, limited technology. And this one has like, they have TV and they have like holograms and it's a bit more sci-fi uh, and noodle shops and everything. You could tell that this whole thing is very Japanese and Korean inspired, like um, aesthetically. And in this world, they have people's nightmares come to life at night. And if they don't get stopped in time. They can grow more powerful night after night to the point where they can kill you because they become materialized as real monsters. 
So what painter's job is that he's a nightmare painter and they travel around at night and they find these nightmares and they, you, they paint images to turn the nightmare into. So they carry around paper and um, brushes and ink and they turn nightmares into other things to stop them from becoming powerful and hurting people. And what painter loves to do is turn them into bamboo. <laughs> And um, everyone's like, why bamboo? It's so easy. And he has a whole thing about art and crisis and stuff. But basically, uh, then the two worlds collide because Painter wakes up one day in the body of Yumi. And he is Yumi. And Yumi is like a unseen ghost, except for those, those two can see and talk to each other. But she's now stuck outside of her body and she has to watch him do all her stuff. It's a whole thing. <laughs> So you're like body hopping while traveling and then it does the opposite and Yumi goes to his world as well. And anyway, it's beautiful. It's sweet. Oh, I love this one. I definitely recommend this one too. Yumi and Tress definitely read even if you're not interested in the Cosmere, like Brandon Sanderson stuff, because these two books are so good and they're standalone. But it gives you a little touch of that. Then the Sunlit Man, it's also in the Cosmere, but I would say don't read this unless you've read both Errors of Mistborn and Stormlight Archive, in including the novellas, especially the, so the novella Dawn Shard, because um, it's very much got stuff to do with that, and it has characters from Stormlight in it, so, um, and set in the future as well, so you don't want to like spoil yourself for either Era 1 or Era 2 of Mistborn or all of the Stormlight Archive. So luckily I'd read all of them except for Dawn Shard because I'm a dum-dum. One novella I haven't read yet and it's mentioned in this book <laughs> but I will say it's really good so I definitely recommend if you've been reading all of Sanderson's stuff definitely read The Sunlit Man. It's real good. Uh, obviously I won't go too much into it but um, it's a character called Nomad and he's also a world hopper like Hoyd and he hops, he's being chased by a group and he hops onto a planet that uh, everyone lives on floating, like traveling cities because if you get, you have, they have to travel away from the sun constantly on the planet because if you get hit by the sun, it will instantly burn you into a crisp and it burns the planet every single day. So it's always changing. <laughs> and that's a really cool concept to me. And he actually has like signs behind how that works like it's like a it's like a smaller planet but has the same density as earth i think that's it so that's how the sun is so powerful anyway it's really cool i definitely recommend that if you're deep into the anderson sanderson universe but yeah definitely all of mistborn all of stormlight um and so in extension to that, I have now read dawn shard as well as a short story and i loved it so much i don't know why i didn't read it originally I've been putting it off because the two point of view characters are two of my some of my favorite side characters in Stormlight Archive. Risen and Lopin. I love them so much. Honestly they're both kind of ding-dongs and so it's great doing this book together <laughs> and it is a seafaring adventure. There's like a sea, a sea storm and oh my god it's so good the action and there's just so much actual like important world stuff happens in this book that um, I should I really should have read it, especially before the Sunlit Man. But now that makes more sense. But now I also have more questions. The joy of the Cosmere. But finally, and then we can move on to the next of books is the Frugal Wizard's Handbook for Surviving Medieval England. This has nothing to do with his um, universe. This is just. Um, it's just a cute little fantasy sci-fi book where basically it's this guy wakes up and he's in medieval England and he has no memory of what, who he is, what he does, what he's doing there, has he time traveled, but he finds a handbook um, on him that explains if, of some of the things he hasn't time traveled. This is a company that has found alternate dimensions that have a very close to us medieval England. Um, and basically this company sells you this dimension planet just to use. You have your private little planet in a dimension of Earth and you can travel to medieval England. And their idea is that because you're from the future, another dimension, 
you are basically a wizard in this new world of yours and you can create what you want become a huge fanciful king if you un you can teach them how to use electricity and just change history go nuts basically um and the handbook excerpts are throughout the book and they're actually really funny because they have a lot of like um a lot of like warnings and advisories and how you know actually this might not be as as you think it is like do you actually know how electricity works how do you teach people how electricity works so it's not the best deal to be honest um but he wakes up in this one and there's something going on in this dimension that's not right there are people abusing it um yeah so that's what it's basically a little one-off story it's really cute it's really fun i think it's meant for a lower grade writing like it's not an adult book i don't think others could enjoy it but it was a cute book um yeah so those are the secret projects that i read this year um and then the other big a lot of stuff that i've been reading is the expanse by james a corey i've read i didn't read i read caliban's war last december and then since then i've read abaddon's gate sabola burn nemesis games and then a whole bunch of the short stories as well drive the butcher of anderson station god's risk the vital abyss a few different ones yeah all the ones that i could because some of the later short stories take part between the later books so i caught up on all that and um so the expanse is a science fiction series it's hard science so it's mostly physically possible it's not like star wars that's the difference star wars is like a space opera it's soft science you have like the hyperdrive or whatever it's called um where you don't really have that in the expanse this is like what if humans could did get to the point where they were traveling the solar system and they lived in the solar system so it is like a hypothetical future of our world um yeah so my hair always goes like gross in this light <laughs> when I'm like talking on the camera I'm just like I'm sweaty <laughs> I get nervous I don't know um yeah so but there is one thing that's like not like scientifically possible yet and that's the creation of the Epstein drive which is what the short story of drive is about so you get some more back information about how it was invented but basically it is kind of like a hyperdrive but more physically possible um <laughs> and basically it like it shortened the, the trip from like earth to mars from six months to two weeks kind of thing so they do have this drive to be able to get out to the outer planets without wasting too much time so there's people who live on earth who live on luna like the moon has been renamed luna officially because they live in other moons as well now there's um people on Mars who are in a generations long project of terraforming it um, and they hate Earth because they think Earth is, Earthans are dumb and people from Earth want to kill them and Earth people think that Mars want to kill them and Mars are actually more strong so it's a real threat and there's a whole cold war between Earth and Mars um, and then there are people who live out in the core it's called the belt which is the moons and space stations around Jupiter and Saturn so Ganymede and things like that and the people who live in the belt they live there for so long in like zero g or, or in like really low fake gravity that their bodies have completely changed they're like super st tall and skinny and have large heads because that's how the body like has grown without gravity and they also have a completely other kind of like creole language where they've all jammed their languages together and it is featured throughout the book after a while you kind of pick it up but a lot of the times like sometimes it's translated for you and sometimes it's not and you just have to deal with it <laughs> like not everyone can understand belters um in the world so like one of the main point of view characters holden is from earth so he's not as although he's been working in the belt for a long time so he's not as um into the belt language as others but yeah so that's kind of the world and they're kind of all in this like little area and then there's a whole like um belt to organization who are kind of like um opposed because they're kind of um they're kind of out there just mining and they're getting used for resources and earth and mars kind of treat belters horribly so they have kind of a um a different like the opa is called um that kind of fights against that 
So there's a lot of power, str power struggle. There's definitely a lot of politics in these books, but I think it's really interesting politics and really well done. And they do a lot of like philosophical, through the storyline, you get a bit of philosophical and political discussion going on, which I really love. Um, I will say, I think you could read Caliban's, um, not Caliban's War. <laughs> you know, wait. Yeah, I read Caliban's War this year. Okay, the first one's Leviathan Wakes. Whoops, I read that in December, but I also read Caliban's War. Anyway, <laughs> I'm getting confused. Um, no, you can read the first book, Leviathan Wakes, basically as a one-off, if you're not sure if you want to read the whole series, but you're interested to hear about the sci-fi and how it works. Um, I think it works pretty well, like, by itself. Like, it leaves you, like, questions about what you want to see in the next book. But overall, I think it's very, like, you can finish and be, like, it, be happy about where it is at the end. Um, but obviously there's bigger questions to do afterwards. But I think it ends all right that you can just read that one and move on with your life. But I will say the first book only has two point of views, which is Miller and Holden. Miller is like a cranky noir detective who's been tasked to find the daughter, of the uh, the missing daughter of a very rich man from Luna, Julie Mao. Um, she went out to the belt because she was rebelling against her rich father and she wanted to help the belters and now she's disappeared. So Miller's looking for her. And then Holden is Holden. He's a ding dong. He's throughout all the books. He's like the main character. But basically he was working on an ice hauler collecting ice for water out in the in space and he was on a separate ship away from their main ship with just a few select of their crew so naomi alex amos and shed i think is also on the ship then um and when they're nearing going back to their main ship they see it get blown up by a martian ship um so now they're stuck on their little ship the Martian ships um, run away and Holden decides he's going to broadcast this to the whole of space, the whole solar system that, Marsh, that Mars just destroyed a ship, um, a water hauler. So <laughs> uh, he probably shouldn't have, but it starts a whole chain of events in the solar system. It starts a whole chain of events through the whole series. Um, and so does what Miller is looking for. Julie Mao is also very important. Um, but you get a whole like thing of that in the book. But, and I really like Miller actually. Holden's a ding dong, but you, you like him, but he's a ding dong. He has a lot to learn. <laughs> he's definitely a flawed hero. Um, he's not perfect, but that's all right. Um, he has a lot to learn and it's going to learn throughout the whole books. Um, but Miller's really cool. And then the second book, if you can continue on, has really awesome characters. It has Point of views from Christian Arasavala and Bobby, two women, finally. You get more women as the books goes on. I, I don't know, I guess James A. Corey, they're actually two writers under the one name. I Maybe they didn't feel good about writing women or they just wanted a simple story at first. But in the second book, you get those two and they're, they're, they're so good. I love Christian so much. She is a high up UN diplomat. So basically earth is entirely run by the united nations like as a whole planet so she's high up on that and she has earth interests obviously and then you have um bobby who is a she is a martian marine so she's from mars and she goes through a, a big event that happens at the start on the, the moon ganymede and then you also get joined in by extra characters and basically every book it has the overarching story throughout, but the better, every book has sort of like a, an enclosed part of the story. So it has a beginning and end in each book about the situation that's happening. And then it leads, unfolds further things in the main story. But everything like you can read one book and be like, cool, now onto the next part, because um, it does usually finish up and doesn't leave you too many cliffhangers in the like, you know, that specific story or event. Really good. Loving it so much. I love the short stories too because they give you a hint on little things like how the drive was invented and then the Butcher of Anderson Station. He's Fred Johnson and you meet him years later when he's known as that 
and um, you don't really, you know that he obviously did something bad, but you don't really know what happened. So the short story gives you the actual, like, what actually happened to lead him to be called the Butcher of Addison Station. And that's really interesting, I think. Um, yeah. So I highly recommend The Expanse if you're after sci-fi that's a little bit more down to earth, so to say. And, uh, but still really fun. Plus, if all that is interesting to you but you don't want to read it, there is a TV show. Um, the first half of it was on sci-fi. This Then it was picked up by Amazon to like save it from cancellation. So I think it's all on Amazon Prime. I think it's five seasons. And it covers the first, no, six seasons. And it covers the first six books. Um, which makes sense, like, it doesn't get cancelled, it just ends because at the end of the sixth book, there's a 30-year time jump, and they obviously didn't want to deal with the time jump, <laughs> so they just ended there with the sixth book, so you get quite a lot of the series on the show, and it's really good, I really enjoyed it. Perfect, um, casting for everyone, I think. Maybe Holden could, I think a lot of people didn't love Holden's casting, but he's alright. <laughs> Uh, everyone else is perfect casting, so, especially Christian, oh my god. <laughs> so, at least check out the TV show. Alright, the next lot of books, before we get into some individual books, is the Broken Earth Trilogy by N.K. Jemisin. And this is the fifth season, The Obelisk Gate and The Stone Sky. And this is a dystopian fantasy trilogy. Um, it and it stars women and people of color. Love it already. Love it, love it, love it. This book, the, this trilogy was so good and so different. Like obviously N.K. Jefferson, she brings a different um, point of view to fantasy with this book and all her books. Um, I definitely want to read more Jamison next year because these were so good. But basically this world is um, has a lot of seismic activity, constant earthquakes, tremors, and volcanoes. And it kind of goes through seasons, as it's called. The fifth season is the first book. The fifth season is like a prophesized final season where basically the earth is going to... That's it. That's the end. <laughs> and uh, But it goes through these seasons of like unhabitability and like um, growth. So basically everyone lives in these calms. Um, they're called comms where they're like little communities where everyone has a role. There's breeders, there's um, security, there's farmers, there's, you know, everyone has a role in the community and they're all very tight knit because it's all about survival. So when a, when a season hits or a seismic event hits, they can come together and survive. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> um, but the other thing, because of the seismic activity, like the earth is constantly um, rumbling and upset. It, it's a lot like our world with tectonic plates and things, but there are actually people who were born with magic ability to control the earth, rocks, stone. Um, they can, uh, you know, and they're kind of like not trusted in society. They're usually taken away and trained up in a, in a completely different place. They train them to basically become tools for society to, they can control tremors, stop earthquakes, get volcanoes dormant, you know, they're just used and they're actually uh, distrusted because they can also create super volcanoes and earthquakes. And um, this is especially true through their emotions. Like emotionally, if they something happens to them, they become emotionally, they could create uh, world ending events basically <laughs> and that's kind of what happens at the start of the fifth season um, the fifth season basically comes about through a whole lot of stuff and through magic people through those magic powers it's a really cool magic system with stone and there's also like if they use too much power like their limbs and their body they can get turned into stone like there's one part where she does this huge um, power thing with rocks and volcanoes and stuff Anyway, but her arm turns to stone because of it. But there are actually these creatures that exist in the world called stone or rock eaters. And one came and like ate her arm off because it was stone anyway. So she kind of had to lug it around. <laughs> it, so after that, she didn't have to anymore. But um, so there's a lot of cool stuff like that. Um, but I will say 
Uh, so I think the overall theme of these books, though, you have this sort of, um, like this overall world. But I think the main theme of these books were really identity and motherhood. <laughs> so I'll tell you about this, the start and how it, the first couple of pages and how it starts. And also a big warning here. I will say um, that the event that starts these books off can be distressing, especially if you have children. So just a little warning there and it happens, it's not the only time it happens. So basically um, you're, you're met with one character, your main character, and she comes home and she finds that her toddler son has been murdered by the, by the father. So that's the distressing part. Um, and more than one child does die in these books. So that's just a fair warning. But if you can get through that, like the, the exploration discussion of motherhood plus female identity or identity overall is really, really good. But yeah, she finds him um, murdered and of course she has to deal with that. And, but also the thing is he has left and taken their young daughter with him. And so she decides she has to get up she has to move on. She has to find her daughter and get revenge on the father, basically. Like, <laughs> she's not happy, all right? She's devastated and she needs to find her daughter. So, and at the same time, a huge seismic event is happening. Um, people think it's the end of the world. Like, whole communities are being eaten up and she has to go out on the road and find her daughter. Um, and that's how the story starts. And there's this whole thing about... Um, yeah, about identity, about childhood, becoming a mother, sacrifice, grief. Oh, it's got everything in it. Honestly, it's so good. Um, I highly recommend it. I will say, though, oh, another warning is that it is written in second person view. And it's hard to, I find it hard to, like, uh, explain what second person is. So per first person is I and... Um, I'm just bringing up a quote here so I can read it out to you to show you from the book to show you kind of like a touch of what it's like but also what second person is like. Third person is like an omniscient narrator. So second person is someone talking to you. <laughs> you basically instead of I. So this is a really nice quote from the book from the first one the fifth season. You think maybe you need to be someone else. You're not sure who. Previous yous have been stronger and colder or warmer and weaker. Either set of qualities is better suited to getting you through the mess you're in. Right now you're cold and weak and that helps no one. You could become someone new maybe. You've done that before. It's surprisingly easy. A new name, a new focus. The try on the sleeves and slacks of a new personality to find the perfect fit. A few days and you'll feel like you've never been anyone else. But so that's the part. And then this is obviously very much showing of the identity part of these books. Um, but I will say there is a reason. It's not just an artistic or stylistic reason to have the you point of view. Uh, there actually is a story reason that you learn in the third book. So I think once you get into it, you really get into it and you get used to it. Um, but it does make those like the first scenes really hard because it's it's you. You are the one who finds your child. So that's a lot, I will say. I just want to do that warning ahead of time so you're prepared, but I, I just read it. These are really good. Love N.K. Jemsen. Definitely going to read more of her stuff next year. So now we're going to talk about some, um, some separate books. They're just like one that I can show you. I just forgot. I forgot one of my other physical books. So let me just grab it. Okay, I totally lied when I said I read only good books because don't come for me. Okay, um, I know this is a very popular book and I read it because it was hyped, but um, actually I mostly read it also because of the cover, but um, it's Legends and Lattes by Travis Baldry. People love this book. People love the second book that just came out. I'm not going to bother reading it, to be honest. I gave this three stars generously. I did not like this. I'm sorry. This is the one book and it's the one book out of all the ones I read that is the most popular, to be honest. But I just didn't care for it. Like I wanted cozy, but I want something to happen. Something, something does happen right at the end, but I don't think that was cozy. <laughs> 
So basically she's an org and she moves to a town that's never heard of coffee and she makes a coffee shop. Um, <clears throat> and my problem is it's not a fantasy coffee shop. I'm sorry, just because there's orcs and demons and a little rat boy who can could bake, which I will say he is my favorite character. And I'll go into a second why that disappoints me. <laughs> yes, it is a fantasy world with fantasy people, but she just builds a Starbucks, to be honest. Like a huge invention is some ceiling fans <laughs> and a huge invention is biscotti. And they're all like, wow, what's this amazing thing? It's a biscotti. Wow, what is this crazy new coffee? It's a cappuccino. <laughs> she just makes a Starbucks. Um, it's not fantasy enough for me. I'm like, that's cool. She made a Starbucks. Good for Viv. I think her name's Viv. Yeah, so. It was just kind of like, and then there's kind of a slow burn romance, but it does nothing. They do like one little kiss at the end and you're like, oh. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it just wasn't enough fantasy. It wasn't... I wanted it to be... I also didn't feel it was cozy enough. Because I feel like this kind of story, like, okay, it's just about her making a coffee shop. And there's a little trials and tribulations along the way. She makes some friends. Do we know anything about these friends? Not really. So I'm trying to find his name. Oh my god, I've been looking through this book for a minute and I can't freaking find his name. But he's like the baker she brings on. Basically, everyone like walks past her shop and joins her. Um, <laughs> that's basically it. Um, and Bishima notices this little rag guy. He has a cool, he's a cute name. Thimble or something. And he's covered in flowers. So she's like, whoa, what's up? Are you a baker? And he's like, yeah, I'm a baker. But he doesn't talk. But And then he like invents cinnamon rolls and biscottis. Um, and bakes for her. But basically, there's nothing else about him. Why was he walking down the street covered in flour? Did he have a previous job? Does he have a place to live? He goes somewhere when it closes. <laughs> what was he doing beforehand? Why does he suddenly just join her? There's nothing about this character. Then you have Tandra, who becomes her assistant. And um, there's a little bit more about her. We get a little bit more. We do get a glimpse of where she lives at the end of the book. But not that much. I know, I feel like this is like the perfect setting to really go into characters and really like love and enjoy some wholesome people, but there's no depth to it. And this, I really want to know what that little baker rat is about. <laughs> like, who is he? What is he? What is, why does he love baking? Why was he going that day before he joined her coffee shop? Does he have another job that he's now just skipped out on? <laughs> I want to know. Uh, I just feel like it's just so lacking. But the cover is gorgeous. I love it. And the concept sounded great. A coffee shop in a fantasy world. But it's just a straight up Starbucks. Like if you just change the names. And the descriptions of things. And that the gnomes created a coffee machine. It's just a coffee shop story. But I feel like, I don't know. Is that what it would be? Surely there's a way to make it more fantasy. I don't know. It just didn't move me. In fact, there's an extra part in this copy that has like a whole extra story added to it, um, pages to fill. And I didn't even bother reading it because by the time I finished the book, I was like, nah, I'm out. <laughs> and I'm usually not that way with books, to be honest. So that was pretty sad, I think. <laughs> I apologize if you like this book. Let me know why. It just, I think I've read too much fantasy at this point to think that that's good enough. I don't know. I just have high standards now, I guess that's it. Um, yeah, so apologies. And I won't be reading the next one. Um, I just, it just wasn't it for me. As much as I love the idea of it. Okay. So the next one was the audiobook. I think it is exclusive to Audible. It's Ghost Station by Dan Wells and we checked this out because Dan Wells is like a writing partner and friend of Brandon Sanderson and he writes, does he write? I think he writes sci-fi mostly or different books but this one seemed really interesting. This is not a sci-fi or fantasy. This is takes place, it 
apologies, <laughs> burps. It takes place in burps. It takes place in um, Cold War uh, Germany in Berlin. Um, basically our main character is a code cracker who works for the western side, so West Berlin, and they kind of spy on, you know, there's always spies on East and West Berlin and Soviet Union and the Allied world. So that's where it's sitting and um, basically it's just a cute little, well not cute, but it's a cool little thriller um, set in this thing where so he cracks codes specifically by one of their like double agents, one of their spies, and then he gets a really weird one from him, and he dis and the spy basically disappears. And then an event happens that no one knew about, no intelligence. So they're like, "What the heck is going on?" And um, they all get embroiled in this thing, and it's really interesting. I found it really fun. It was a nice little interlude between other bigger books really well written. Uh, I really enjoyed the style and like the setting of Germany and because Dan Wells has lived in Germany before so he has like some knowledge of it. <laughs> um, and then Ghost Station is basically because you know how there's a train subway system that runs through Berlin um, and it was built to connect east, you know, it's built between east and west before it got split. So the, the trains still run and basically the train stations, the stops that are on the um, east side of Berlin, the Soviet Union part of Berlin, are all boarded up and like they're empty and they're ghost stations and you kind of like worry about going past them because what if something happens? Because your enemy is basically there. Um, and it's a lot about how people were dealing with the split city and, you know, being disconnected from friends and family who are on the other side, you know, the whole Berlin Wall thing. So it was really, really interesting and um, framed by the whole code breaking and spy stuff. It was really fun. So definitely recommend that if that's more of your style. Then I read Station Eternity by Mer Lafferty. This is the um, cozy sci-fi murder mystery that I've been talking about this year. The second book to it came out in November and I have yet to read it because I've been busy with The Expanse, but I do, I pre-ordered it and I have it and I'm looking forward to the second book. The Station Eternity is, well, basically in the world, it's our world that's basically just discovered that aliens exist. We find out that aliens have known about us all along and they kind of treat Earth as a tourist destination. They like to come and get drunk and... <laughs> and have a look at us. Um, we're kind of considered inferior or dumber existence within all the aliens. There are different kinds of aliens, different species and worlds, um, but they're all, all of them uh, have a symbiotic relationship with something else. They're symbiotic entities and because humans are not, they think that's kind of weird. So they're not super into us. <clears throat> and humans are like, please let us join your, your alien world. <laughs> You seem really cool, and plus you have tourists here all the time. So that leads us to our main character. Um, she, I can't remember her name. I can't remember most people's names, I apologize. But her main character, she has grown up with murder around her her whole life. It seems like if she gets to know somebody, they're gonna get murdered. <laughs> and not by her. Like, they get murdered legitimately by other people. But it always seems to happen around her and she has this weird intuitive way of being able to help the cubs solve the crime in a way that they aren't able to notice that. And that's why they're super suspicious of her. Like she has her own FBI agent because who covers her because they don't trust her. Because how does she know how to solve these murders that happen around her but she's not ever the murderer. Anyway, <laughs> that's kind of a thing that she says, I'm sick of this. She tried to be like a hermit and she actually wrote murder mysteries based off those murders, which ethically seems a bit wrong to me. But anyway, she became like a recluse and yet still murder followed her because she couldn't, people can't stop just being friends with each other, right? Getting to know each other. So she hitches a ride on an alien ship that's stopping over for tourism and she gets to this space station, Station Eternity. And, and begs, because no humans are allowed on these things yet, she begs to be able to stay because of these circumstances. And she's hoping that maybe aliens aren't affected by the same thing 
that humans are. And the station allows her. The station itself is kind of like a sentient being. So it has like, um, you know, other thoughts and feelings. So she's allowed to stay on eternity. And there are two other humans there. One that's not supposed to be there really. And uh, the, one, the one, one main human who's allowed to be there, he's a diplomat trying to get permission for humans to go on the station. So this is where it brings us, uh, a huge event happens. She finds out, because she's kept out in the dark, because um, she's not, <laughs> the diplomat doesn't think she should be there either. Basically, a huge, a big shuttle of people is coming to the station, um, perhaps to be able to live, th you know, they're visiting the station for the very first time. And she's like, oh no, a station, a, a shuttle full of people. Because so far it's been fine on the station. The state, as just the shuttle comes up, um, an alien gets murdered and it messes up the station because they're connected and it messes up and the station ends up attacking the shuttle. And so they have to rescue the humans. And so they now have to deal with that and they have to deal with the murder. And she's just like, why? Why me? I guess I'm going to have to solve this. <laughs> I guess it's me. <laughs> and um, it's really, really fun. You, it's really fun just to be on this one spaceship one station trying to figure out why this all this event happened and um and you're dealing with all these different aliens like one group of them are a like they're wasp they're like wasps like a horde of wasps and they all share they have like hive mind they're pretty cool um and she's terrified of wasps so <laughs> it's not great um but you have lots of really different aliens which are really cute and i really enjoy their characters and you get to know them and uh, you also get to know the people who are on the shuttle. So you get um, stories about just them and how they ended up on the shuttle, like why they're on the shuttle, what led to that, who they are as a person, and lots of stuff happens. And there's also a very, very, very slow burn, perhaps nothing to friendship to maybe romance in the future. I, I haven't read the second book to see if it leads to that, but it's kind of there. It's kind of growing. It's slow burn, but it is really satisfying. But yeah, I really love this book. It doesn't have the best, I think it's like three something on Goodreads. And I, you know, and I didn't like that um, Legends of Lattes book. So I feel like I don't always agree with Goodreads. I thought this was a really good read, especially if you want like, that cozy murder mystery, but also some sci-fi elements. Um, I think it was really good and really well written. And I enjoyed the character. She is definitely a flawed character and she comes to see that like and start working on herself during the book as well. There's like different levels because obviously from a life that she's experienced, she's a bit, she's a bit traumatized um, and not very, um, doesn't have the best self-esteem because of what's happened in her life. It's very understandable, but she kind of, you know, she has to step up to the plate and um, she makes new alien friends and it's great. So love that book definitely recommend station eternity by mer laverty um and so before we get into my last physical books i'll go over a last um uh audio book that i read which was witch king by martha wells and this was in the first round of fantasy books and the goodreads thing but it didn't make it to the final round which is disappointing because witch king was really good uh if you want a one-off Really interesting, different fantasy. I highly recommend Witch King by Martha Wells. I know her like Murderbot series is really popular. That's a sci-fi. Witch King is about a demon, and demons come up from hell, and they um, and they're invited usually to take pe to possess people's bodies, and they basically um, as a person is in their culture that they come from. The person is dying and soon they invite the demon to take their body and they work with the community um, and it's kind of like a way of honoring the dead. Anyway, so the Witch King is a demon, demon powers, um, there are also witches in this world. So there's like demons and witches kind of work together or against each other. Um, oh my god, there's so much. It's hard to explain. I actually read it over twice to be honest. I was reading a lot of it while I was doing like playing The Sims and I realized I can't pay attention. <laughs> so I reread like a big chunk of the book, but it was really, really good. There's different timelines. Is there, there's three timelines, I think. 
Um, basically, they lived in this world where, you know, the one culture, basically, they're like a plains nomadic people, and they had these deals with demons and witches, and then a huge empire rises up from, I think, they don't know where the empire comes from, and they don't know how they rose up. They just appeared into this continent, um, and they basically destroyed everybody and captured everybody. So the start of the Witch King is years after the empire and its effects, and basically the ending of the empire, where they created a republic kind of thing. Um, I think it's a republic, but that's the beginning. And then you get scenes from the actual time that the empire rises up and attacks and your like demon character is dealing this whole thing i can't remember his name but he's really cute <laughs> so you kind of see what happens to him in his culture and you kind of will see it a little bits before that as well when he's just a little demon and he first comes to to earth i guess how you call it um it's not earth but you know it's a fantasy world um, but this, like, the Empire has this ability to basically um, disable demons and witches and their powers, and that's why it's so devastating. Um, and they have their own type of magic. And then there's also these people, I think they're called the Immortal Dragons or something like that. They're, they're like a mortal group, a group of immortals. They also get embroiled into it and they kind of just give in to the Empire. There's a whole stuff in here. Okay, but we basically start off like years later, the Witch King, he wakes up and he finds himself in a tomb with people trying to break in and like take him so they could control him. But he's able to like fight back and get away from them and he's able to find his companion who's also been entombed with him. Um, she's cool, she's a witch. And she's like, and they have like, he has these little, they're called heart pearls. The little pearls in each other's hearts so they can keep track of where each other are and also communicate telepathically and so they have one with so that, that's how he finds his witch friend um who was entombed in the same building and then they're like well i can't and she is now like um she has a wife and she can't feel the pearl of her wife so they're like what's happened to her where is she how did we end up here um, they end up with this little girl that was with them, which was with the group. Um, so they take her along. It's very much like we collect people as we travel. So they collect a lot of people on the way, <laughs> trying to find um, his witch friend's wife, basically, and her kids to see if they're okay and what the hell happened and figure out who entombed them, um, how much time has passed. So they basically, they go on this journey to do that, like who's betrayed them, basically. And then between that, you get flashbacks into how the Empire rose up. And um, yeah, no, it's actually really interesting. It's definitely a very different fantasy world, and I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, it's a one-off, so you can just read it, but I'm kind of sad it's a one-off. I kind of want more of these characters. I think the demon thing is really fun. And he has like, and the demons and witches have their own kind of different powers. It's a very different world as well. There's like um there's like powers to create like um ships that are fly, but also there's ships that are on the backs of big giant sea creatures. And I don't know, it's fascinating. And there's a lot of like dead cultures and uh, mysteries, but because the demon and the witches are sort of immortal, they're kind of seen as like, you know, they've seen a lot of other things. So yeah. I thought it was really good. I really recommend Witch King. If you want something a little bit different for fantasy, I highly recommend it. I feel like I'm sad it didn't get into the final round because I think it deserved it, but what you gonna do? Okay, the next lot of books we're gonna finish up with are physicals. So let me go grab them. All right, so this first one is The Last Unicorn by Peter S. Beagle. Look at this beautiful color. I did do this cover for my last unicorn art set that I did um, because I love this. So basically I loved the movie, there's an animated movie from the 80s called The Last Unicorn of this book. The screenplay is by Peter S. Beagle so it's pretty much mostly the book. There's um, stuff he's taken out, um, there's like whole side stories in here so you get a lot more but it's pretty much the movie works. 
um, is what you want from The Last Unicorn. And I was obsessed with that movie as a kid. You know the one that you went to the video store and you rented it every week? And it's like, why don't we just buy a copy? Like, <laughs> I just watched it so much. I loved it so much. Um, and my dad really liked the music in the movie is by America. And my dad liked America at the time. So we really enjoyed the film together. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I love that book forever. And I'm 35 and I've only just read the book. I, I just put it up for a long time. Um, but I'm really glad I finally read it. Basically, I would say that this is in the pantheon of fantasy of The Hobbit and The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It's up with them. It's like the American version of those. <laughs> the Last Unicorn. So basically, if you haven't, if you don't know what it's about, it's about a unicorn. And she, <laughs> it's an immortal unicorn. And she lives in her forest, which she protects with her magic. And some hunters pass through and they're like, we're not going to get any stuff here because clearly a unicorn lives here. And the other guy's like, unicorns don't exist. There are no, no unicorns. And he's like, well, this, this is probably the last unicorn that exists, I guess, because it feels like there's magic here and they leave. And the unicorn's like, am I the last unicorn? Because when you're immortal, you don't really notice stuff happening over time. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's just a lot of stuff. A lot of themes about immortality in this book, obviously. Um, but she's like, I guess I never noticed. Like, am I the last one? And then she finds out from a butterfly. Um, she doesn't know if it's a real story because butterflies just kind of regurgitate things <laughs> in this world. But the butterfly says that all the unicorns long ago were herded up by the Red Bull and were driven away down the roads um, and captured. And the Red Bull is basically what you think. It's a big demonic Red Bull. <laughs> um, it's a big creature. But So basically she's like, you know what? I can't leave. I need to find out what happened to them. I can't be the last unicorn. So she leaves her forest and she goes on an adventure to find the unicorns. And she picks up a wizard, Schmendrick, on the way, as well as a sort of, she's kind of like a... A, like a servant maid to a, pi a group of pirates basically called Molly and there's some really good stuff with Molly because she's like a middle-aged woman and you have that whole um and she's like how dare you come to me now to the when she meets the unicorn because there's this whole thing uh you know obviously in our world as well as this one mythology of unicorns is that they appear to virgins and young maids and she's like, how dare you come to me now when I'm like this? So you have like this idea of aging and immortality. And um, it's really, really, really fascinating, like um, really beautiful, deep things being said in this book. Um, there's a lot of beautiful quotes from this, honestly. I love it. And some, a lot of it is in the movie. Uh, but there's sections that are not in the movie, such as this whole side story prophecy of this village that's connected so basically she ends up at this king haggard's castle and his son prince liam and in the book there's a whole village that's kind of connected to this castle that has a prophecy connected to it that a son from this village will rise up and destroy haggard's castle so basically none of them ever have children because uh, if they don't have children, they're kind of in this world where they have overabundance. So basically, once Haggard's castle falls, they will lose their abundance. It's a whole thing. There's a lot of fantasy stuff in here. It's pretty fun. <laughs> um, but you kind of end up at, at Haggard's, and this is where the adventure really goes um, into it, rather than the actual, like, walking through places. Um, and, in the, and in the movie, Haggard is played by Christopher Lee, so pretty good <laughs> and Prince Lear is played by Jeff Bridges the voices anyway because it's animated but yeah oh I'm so glad I finally read it because it's so beautiful I highly recommend reading this the version this copy has a forward by Patrick Rothfuss which um if you know about him you know about him he famously has uh, a really 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 good trilogy that he's never written the third book for He's, he's kind of like on George R. R. Martin level of that. <laughs> I'm not finishing their books. But he wrote the intro to this this last year. So he's still doing stuff. He's just not. He's finishing his books. <laughs> um, 
but he kind of talks about like he picked it up and read it and was like this is the best thing I've ever read and honestly like it's up there with The Hobbit and The Bat the, Lion, Witch and the Wardrobe to me. I highly recommend this one. Um, the Last Unicorn. Really beautiful, not too heavy a read. Really good. Love that. It's a classic for a reason. Next I have my Spooky October read. Oh look at that foiling. This is Garth Marenghi's Terror Tome. Curl up with this book and die. <laughs> um, and signed by the author, which is why I have the physical copy. Where is it? Wait, wait, there we go. Marth Garth Marenghi has signed this. Um, this has a big backstory to it. You, I don't think you can just pick this up and read it. You need to know what's behind, like the context of this book. So Garth Marenghi is not a real horror writer. He is created by the actor, writer, director, um, Matthew Holness, who is a British like comedic actor basically, but he does horror as well. And when was it? This is the 2000s, I think, is when they made the show Garth Marenghi's Dark Place. It's only six episodes. The whole show is on YouTube, so you can just go and watch it. Um, and it is about Garth Marenghi. So Garth Marenghi is a horror writer, as he says. Um, he's an auteur, a dream weaver, you know, he's a ridiculous person. <laughs> it is comedy and it is satire, like possibly some of the most brilliant satire on Brit British television or even television. Um, so in the 80s, Garth Marenghi wrote this uh, medical horror show called Dark Place. And it was never aired because it was so terrifying and disturbing to audiences. It couldn't be trusted to be aired. But now, because there's nothing else to play on TV, they've gone like, hey, Garth Marenghi, can we play your show on TV? And he's like, fine. And then they include interviews with him, um, the producer and one of the actors, Dean Lerner, and also one of the actors who's played by Matt Berry, who, if you love Matt Berry, especially from Toast of London and um what we do in the shadows you have to complete his collection and re watch all of his stuff which includes dark place because he's really good in it um and basically like it's intertwined through the episodes where they talk about making the episodes and it's kind of like it's a really bad show with really bad horror but to the point that it's hilarious like it i feel like it's a very like it's a it's a fine art of how to make something bad so bad it's funny and really good and well done. That was Dark Place. <laughs> anyway, that was years ago. And you kind of get snippets of Garth Marenghi's writing in there as a character. And obviously Matthew Holmes was like, you know what, why don't I just write his story straight up? We finally have Garth Marenghi books to read. So um, <laughs> I think you definitely need to watch the show to understand the humor and the character of Garth Marenghi, because it comes out in the book, obviously, a lot. <laughs> um, but the books, uh, so in The Dark Place, he plays a doctor called Rick Daglas Empty. And in these books, he's writing a horror writer called Nick Steen. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and it's three short stories, and they're all connected to each other. It's Typeface, Dark Lord of the Prolix, Bride of Bone and the Dark Fractions. And I will say a big element is that Garth Marenghi is an egotistical, misogynist jerk. <laughs> he's a jerk. He's so up his own butt. He thinks he's amazing. He thinks he's the most talented. One of the quotes he has from the show, Dark Place, is that he's written more books than he's ever read. And also that um, some authors use subtext and they're all cowards. So he's not a good writer, but he thinks he is. Um, and he's not great to women, but in a funny way. Like in a, oh my God, this guy is a misogynist way. Like you're not laughing at the women, you're laughing at him. And it comes up across in this book. There's even a map in here, by the way, uh, of where Nick Steen lives. <laughs> but first, basically the first part of the book and what goes through the rest of the book is that Nick Steen tracks down and finds a, um, a, a, what he heard was a magical typewriter that would help him write the best things ever. But the typewriter is actually basically cursed, basically a demon, and it writes utter gibberish, which he thinks 
under its spell basically is amazing and no one understands it because it's too smart for them but it's actually terrible trash which he realizes later um but he gets into a physical relationship with this typewriter it's very unhealthy and by physical i mean he gets with this typewriter man <laughs> and the description is like what and he also, his editor throughout is like, what is this stuff, Nick? What are you doing? He's like, I don't need an editor anymore. Mm. <laughs> I have my typewriter, love it now. <laughs> and it goes on from there. Um, that's just the beginning. <laughs> um, there is actual real um, horror in here as well, which nicely enough, he tells you when they're coming. It's called a fright break. And um, in the book, physically because I read this I have the physical but I read the audiobook because um, it's also performed by Matthew Holness as Garth Marenghi so it's even funnier but he has fright break and so in the book you have to go to the back of the book to read the scary stuff and he says you know like you have to start fright break welcome friend to page 281 you have chosen unwisely now dim the lights grab a tissue if you need one Though I'd urge those types not to attend any signings and enjoy this excised but not censored passage of pure, unadulterated body horror. And um, it is. It is body horror. And I decided, because um, he said, like, don't be a coward. If you want to be a coward, you can skip. In the audiobook, he's like, skip to the next track now so you can skip it if you're a coward. And I was like, I'm not a coward. <laughs> Goth Marenghi, I'm going to read it. And um, it's gross. <laughs> There's some real body horror in here, okay? He gets flayed, basically. Um, there's also a additional fright break. There's a third and final fright break. And then there's a horotica section, which is basically like a steamy 80s um, scene. <laughs> Um, welcome, friend, to this excised passage of spicy horror content. Mm. So, um, yeah, <laughs> there's a bit of that as well. So I think that's really fun. Um, yeah, if you understand the humor and you're into it, I highly recommend picking this up because it's basically more dark place without the medical stuff. Um, but yeah, it's all in his tone and the audiobook is even better because he's actually saying it. Um... But yes, and it's really like if reading through the complete audiobook is so worth it because he does, he reads out the copyright information at the end and it's like copyright to Matthew Holness. And he's like, I don't know who that is. It belongs to me, Garth Marenghi. <laughs> um, but it's pretty funny. He's like, you have been warned. But um, so you have some quotes on the back. You have reads like Garth's classic view of paperback horrors crossed with the X-Files. Faustian myth and bits of the manimal, plus the cover is embossed with genuine foil at his insistence and at your expense. From Ken Holder, Head of Hodder. Then you have three tales of terror by Garth Marenghi, uh, dot dot dot, quality. <laughs> From Queen Faggot, knows for at um dot com. And then a strong beginning, deepening intrigue and a knockout ending from How to Write Magazine. So that's Garth Marenghi's Territorium. At least check out the TV show. It's all on YouTube, I'm pretty sure. Amazing satire of bad horror writing, bad 80s TV shows, bad filmmaking. So good. Loved it, loved it. And I, I'm glad there are books now because it's hilarious. There's a second one, which is on my shelf. It's called Incarcerat. Um, because he released Territorium last October. I didn't really, I wanted to read it during spooky time. Um, and now he's released the second one this October, so I'm going to wait till next October to read it. But very, very good. And then finally, to end up this video, we are going... Um, it's very long now, but I'm, thank you so much for joining in with me. But finally, we have One Piece. One Piece. Do, 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 do. Anyway, um, this is the... I've been starting to buy the omnibuses. So this is volume one, two, and three into one. Uh, so you buy them basically in three volumes. I think later on, as the volumes and story arcs get longer, there's less of the omnibus, I'm pretty sure. Like maybe one or two. But, um, and then maybe even individual volumes because as the series goes on, the stories get longer. 
But yes, I'm finally reading One Piece manga. I read all three volumes. They actually did take some time. Um, I don't know, a couple of nights each. They're not like a, you know, sit down, read it for a couple, for an hour or so and you're done. Which I feel like I get a lot of out of graphic novels um, and other manga, but this is pretty like in depth. There's actually a lot of text when you look through it, but um, yeah, so I gotta hold it the right way. <laughs> It is a Japanese manga, so you read it the opposite way that we do. Um, but yeah, what can I say about One Piece? Uh, <laughs> I love One Piece. I started watching One Piece in 2012, 10 years ago now. Um, we went to our first trip to Japan and we saw it everywhere. And we're like, we should probably check this out because it's everywhere in Tokyo, everywhere. Um, when we finally watched it, we ended up watching se over 700 episodes of the anime, um, which was the most at the time that we finished watching, but it's now up to 1,090 something. So uh, we missed like, yeah, there's still half of the show we haven't watched since we stopped watching. <laughs> um, I will say the anime is good. It is a lot of it's all on Crunchyroll, I'm pretty sure, if you want to subscribe to Crunchyroll. But um, <clears throat> it is a lot. It takes a long time. Um, eventually you start, there's always an intro and what happened last time and the outro. So you kind of fast forward through those and then episodes end up being about 15 minutes long. But that's still 15 times a thousand. So there's a lot, but the anime is great. Um, but the anime manga and the Netflix live action are all different stuff. Okay? Like the anime is different from the manga and the live action takes from the manga, but obviously it changes things to create an eight episode season. Um, honestly, I'd say watch the Netflix live action. I, I can't stress this enough. It is so good. It's only eight episodes, but you get so much. It really digs into what these characters are about and what makes them so great. Especially Luffy, he's just, he's the eternal optimist. He's, he's all about following your dreams and being optimistic about that. Basically, follow your dreams and that's it. If that's your dream, you gotta do it. And I love that. I, I think everybody wants Luffy as a friend, to be honest. And he just collects people. He's like, you're cool, you're coming with me. You're on my crew now. <laughs> and he does that all the time, constantly. But basically, um, the live action covers 44 episodes of the anime which is basically the whole of the east blue saga and for the basically to read the manga of the entire netflix live action show you need to read four of these omnibuses so three six nine twelve volumes finishes the east blue saga um so yeah there's a lot of manga to read as well, but it's all nicely put into these. I just got this from Amazon. Um, the second one was sold out for a while actually, but we finally got it. You just gotta keep an eye on them because they do come back in stock. But I, I've now bought the first four omnibuses. So basically the whole East Blue Saga. Um, two of them just arrived and one is still coming to my mailbox. But yeah, so I read the first lot is very different to the live action and also different to the anime. <laughs> They're all kind of different to each other so you can kind of enjoy all of them to be honest. But I recommend starting with the live action and then getting into the manga because the manga is what they're using as their reference. Um, yeah it's really really fun. It's fantasy. It's pirates. That you can eat devil fruits which give you special powers and in East Blue they're very rare. Um, but once you get into the Grand Line, which they're going to, which is a big, like, um, more dangerous stretch of sea with lots of big pirates and craziness, there's a lot more devil fruit eaters out there and a lot more powers. There's different kinds of fruits you're going to find out and different kinds of powers. But um, I think you only actually see two of them in the East Blue Saga, two devil fruit users, Buggy and Luffy. Uh, but yeah, so... You know, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Oh my gosh. And there's places where you're going to cry your eyes out in volume two. I, I cried. <laughs> I cried already in volume two. Um, if you don't know, it's Choo Choo. He makes me cry so much. He's not really... 
this is why it's a good thing to watch both live action and this because Choo Choo's not really, his story isn't in the live action. They obviously didn't have time because they put 40 chapters of, of a story into eight episodes, but um, you get a glimpse of him in the show and then you meet him properly in volume two and you will cry. Choo Choo! But um, yeah. <laughs> And there's a lot of crying later on. Um, oh my gosh, it's a very emotional story. There's a lot of emotion. I've seen someone say that's kind of our modern version of the Odyssey because it's like a never ending sea venture. And basically Luffy and his crew, every time they land to a different island, they they got to deal. There's always someone bad on every island, right? And they got to, Luffy's got to take him down because he won't see people get bullied. Uh, and he hates bad people, <laughs> even though he's a pirate. And you're like, okay, yeah, pirates are good and marines are bad, but it's a lot more gray than that. There's good pirates, bad pirates, very, very bad pirates. Um, as you get further on into the story, there's worse and worse people. So in the 700s where I stopped watching the anime was Do Flamingo. We watched until the very end of his arc because it's very long. It's a long arc and we were watching it weekly at that time. Um, I highly recommend binging the anime. So at least there's a lot of episodes to binge because it's better to binge it than to watch it weekly to be honest. Um, but Don Flamingo, oh my god, I hate him so much. There's so many people, like the, the big villains that you hate. And you know, you know that Luffy's gonna take him down and it's so good. <laughs> You're like, yes, Luffy, I love you. That guy's so evil. <sighs> That's one piece. I, I, I'm done I will stop talking about this because this is a reading thing and it's not a one piece video. <laughs> I just always love it. Like you, you hear about these things in these huge animes and you're like, oh yeah, it's real popular, whatever. No, it's popular for a reason because it's actually really fun and emotional and good. And there's a, the, just the overarching thing about following your dreams, figuring out what you want in your life, about freedom, about um, friendship is very important here as well, about how you treat others. There's a lot of stuff in here and it's really, really good. And I just adore Luffy so much. But I think the best is depiction of Luffy for the beginning story is definitely the live action. Probably because, uh, you know, Oda was the create the writer, Ichiro, Ichiro Oda, Oda. Uh, Oda was very, very part of the live action. He actually cast all the actors and things. And I feel like they really got the sense of what Luffy is now in the later books. Let's show him that way in, um, in the show as well, because he kind of does start off a bit of a jerk. <laughs> Like a well-meaning jerk. He's kind of a dum-dum in a like almost mean sense. But I think he gets better and I think they really show that his later character um, depiction is better in the live action. Um, where he's not quite such a jerk. Because <laughs> like in this book, if you've watched live action, Kobe does all the work for Kobe. Um, and Luffy's kind of a jerk to Kobe at the beginning, whereas in the live action, I feel like he's a lot better to Kobe, which I prefer, but it's about different adaptions and we're here about reading and not adaptions, but I still really love the, man the manga so much. I'm so glad I'm starting to read it. I kind of got urged on by Andrew, which is funny because I was like, I'm, the one, I'm basically the one who pushed One Piece onto her. Well, I, I think I just mentioned it a lot, so she checked it out because she also loves fantasy and pirates and you know, you get both of that. And then she sent me a picture that she got the first, she got this. And I was like, you know what? Why haven't I read the manga, huh? Me. <laughs> so I went and picked it up as well. <laughs> so I'm finally reading it thanks to Andrea. But yeah, I think that's everything I wanted to talk about in this video. Um, I, I'll have a look at my Goodreads to see if there's anything I need to pick up. But um, I think I just kind of filled up the end of my year with um, short stories because reading challenges are hard. So I've got 33 books out of 30 because I read a whole bunch of the short stories, but I think that counts. Um, let's have a look. 
No, I, I think I've talked about everything except for the Wet Moon graphic novel series, but I honestly don't really want to talk about them. Uh, I think they're very subjective. I love them because I grew up with them. Like, um, they started coming out when I was 14 and I started collecting them then. And I was really into that artist, Sophie Campbell. And so it's very, very personal to me. And I, um, I never got around to reading the seventh and final graphic novel. So I ended up buying all of them. Well, my dad got them for Christmas for me last year. And I read all seven of them finally and finished it this year. But uh, I don't really want to talk about them because they're very subjective. Uh, if <laughs> they're probably very polarizing, I, I bet, um, with the way they, they show things like there's not the best people in it, but to me, it means a lot to me. So, um, I was really good reading those, but I think I've talked about everything that I've read this year. Um, you should let me know. Have you read any of this stuff? Like not this year, like any time. Did you read them? What were your thoughts? Did you like Legends and Lattes? I bet most people do like it, but for me, it just didn't work out. You know, I don't know. Um, what do I have in my one to read? Let's have a look here. Let's make this video longer. No, I'm just going to do one second of having a look. Um, there's a cool video that, uh, mo video. There's a cool book that came up called Generation Ship from Mammy, uh, Michael Bame. And that sounded really cool. Um, what was it? Uh, it, it's a standalone, it's the beginning of a new human colony. And there's um, tyrannical leaders, revolution, crippling instability, and an unknown alien planet that could destroy them all. So they're on a colony ship that's left Earth for another planet. And 250 years later, they finally arrive. So, you know, these generations, you live on these spaceships for generations before you finally get to the planet. And then, you know, they're, they're living in a tin can for generations. Stuff is going to happen. And then they're on an alien planet. So that sounds really fun. Then, of course, I really want to read the next Mer Lafferty book called Chaos Terminal. So it's officially called The Midsolar Murders. So, yeah, I love that because um, they do actually reference Midsummer Murders in the book. And this is The Midsolar Murders. Oh, my God. Do you guys like Midsummer Murders? That was such a good show. Like the first episode tells you everything. There's a gay undertaker. There's incest. There's just, it's a crate in a tiny English village. Like who would, there's, the joke is always like, who would live in Midsummer? Because everyone gets murdered there. But anyway, <laughs> I love Midsummer murders. So yeah, chaos, so the Mer Lafferty books really do like have that kind of feel to them. I think this is a, this book is historical fiction called Queen of Exiles by Vanessa Riley. And it's based on Haiti's Queen Marie Louise Coydevid, um, who escaped a coup in Haiti. So that sounds really cool during the Regency period. Oh, and then I have to catch up on the Wheel of Time. I'm up to the fourth book called The Shadow Rising. So I'm going to read the rest of them. There's 14 books in the middle of time. I talked about those last year on my reading thing. And I also want to reread The Stormlight Archive by Brandon Sanderson because the fifth book is coming out at the end of ne on December 7th next year. Which is so exciting. Okay, so The Stormlight Archive is supposed to be 10 books. This is the fifth book and there's going to be a time jump after that. So this is like the first era. So it's kind of, kind of going to be enclosed. Um, so it's going to be nuts to see sort of the ending of these characters. But I have to reread all of Stormlight Archive, which I read them all for the first time last year. So now I have to reread. <laughs> They're long, friends. The first book is 45 hours long in the audiobook, but and they get longer after that. But it's so worth it because they're so good. I mean, it's subjective. <laughs> That's the thing about books. They're all subjective and you love what you love and you hate what you hate and not everyone's going to agree with you or disagree with you. So that's the fun of it. That's kind of what I've got to do next year. I've got to finish The Expanse. I have a lot of reading to do next to you guys. i got a whole bunch of One Piece manga to read. I feel like it's never ending. Um, <laughs> and then a whole bunch of one-offs. 
I don't know, but it is fun. It's nice to have something to do, especially with like, um, now that I've, you know, since I've gotten into audiobooks, it makes it so much easier and so much, um, for me to be able to read it. Like I can read short stories and manga, um, physically, but the long books, I really, really struggle with reading and audiobooks has helped so much because um, I really do need to do other things while I listen to them and I still take them in. Um, I'm able to do my drawing while I read an audiobook and it actually helps me keep motivated into drawing as well, doing my work because I'm like, well, I want to continue on with my book. So they kind of go hand in hand. Um, yeah, it's much later now. I've just looked at my clock. <laughs> so I'm going to finish this video. It's probably super long. But thank you so much for hanging out with me. I hope I proved to be entertaining to you while you did something or you just wa just watch my face. Who are you? <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> Why are you looking at my face? Um, I'm sure you just listened to me while doing things. So I hope I kept you entertained for this time, however long it was. I've been stopping and starting my um, recording. So I'm not sure how long this video is going to be. It's going to be long, but I had a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, I don't, the only other person who hears this stuff is Locke and they're probably sick of it. So, um, <laughs> plus they read a lot of the same books as me. So we kind of just like blabber on at each other about them once we've both read them. But yeah, it's just been fun. Um, I, so I could do this even monthly or even just quarterly. Maybe I'll do one, uh, like do four over the year. But that's if that's if you're interested in watching it constantly, or uh, maybe you just like having this one long video in Planmas and just sitting down and enjoying it. But otherwise, yeah, let me know. Let me know what you you're reading, what you've read, if you're reading if any of these, what you're planning to read. It'd be interesting to see what you want to read. That could add to my to do my to read list <laughs> um, and make it worse. But otherwise, yeah, that's it for today. If you like it don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe obviously i don't really do reading book stuff that much on my channel uh, if this is what you caught this for but um my channel is really a planning channel but yeah we talk about books through my plan with me's because obviously i'm reading them through the uh, weeks and so I, I like to touch on them when i finish them um during my plan with me's but otherwise that's about it but otherwise i hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and I'll see you tomorrow because Planmas continues on through the 25th. But yeah, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. I love you. Bye-bye. Little rascals wave. Bye-bye.